Hi, I'm James Taylor, business creativity and innovation keynote speaker, and this is The Creative Life, a show dedicated to you, the creative. If you're looking for motivation, inspiration, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's an author, musician, entrepreneur, performer, designer, or thought leader. They'll share with you their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, and much, much more. You'll find show notes for this episode, as well as free training on creativity, over at jamestaylor.me. Enjoy this episode. Hi, it's James Taylor here. Today's episode was first aired as part of International Authors Summit. This inspiring virtual summit reveals the secrets of making, marketing, and monetizing a best-selling book. If you would like to access the full video version as well as in-depth sessions with over 40 best-selling authors, then I've got a very special offer for you. Just go to internationalauthorssummit.com where you'll be able to register for a free pass for the summit. Yeah, that's right. Over 40 New York Times and Amazon best-selling authors, book editors, agents, and publishers sharing their insights, strategies, and tactics on how to write and market your first or next bestseller. So just go to internationalauthorssummit.com, but not before you listen to today's episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to welcome Charlie Hone. Charlie Hone is an author, marketing strategist, speaker, and head of video for Scribe Media. He studied under authors including Seth Godin, Ramit Sethi, and Tucker Max, and helped Tim Ferriss in the production and launch of the New York Times bestseller, The 4-Hour Body. Charlie's own books include Play It Away and the popular career guide Recession Proof Graduate. And when not writing, you'll find him advising authors on how to best market their work. So it's my great pleasure to have Charlie with us today. So welcome, Charlie. Thank you, James. I appreciate you having me on. So share with everyone what's going on in your world just now, what you're working on. Uh, right now, I am just doing a bunch of video for our company, Scribe. So we, uh, I mean, we just shot a video uh, to introduce our publishing managers to new authors that they're working with. So quick 30 second video saying, hey, I'm Natalie, you know, I'm going to be working with you on your book, that sort of thing. So this is an interesting one because you think as, as, as authors, writers, it's all like about this stuff and it's this. So what role does video have today for, for an author? Yeah, I mean, it's good. Uh, so video is the future, like to, to me, and uh, all the data pretty much shows it. Uh, it's the most sensory medium that you have. It's the most engaging. And to me, it's the most exciting way to tell a story. So not necessarily to push people away from books, but it's just another way to, to grab them and uh, engage them. So let's talk about your story. You have a very interesting story. So you and, you and I actually had in communication many years ago when you were working with Tim Ferriss um, on The 4-Hour Body. What was our communication? I think I was working in Northern California at the time with a technology company, and it was an online education company, a little bit like lynda.com. And we reached out with Tim, to yourself and Tim about working on something. Anyway, it, was, it wasn't right, but... Uh, I remember kind of seeing you kind of you at the time, and I know Tim talked a lot about about having someone, you know, having yourself kind of and a, and a team of people kind of really helping him. So, first of all, how did that relationship start, and and then how did that kind of segue into the work that you're doing today? It started really in 2008. I graduated from college. It was the recession, so no one was hiring, and after a few months of failing to get any employer to want to hire me. I just started reaching out to people I admired and offering to uh, to work with them for, for free. Uh, so I would propose basically uh, projects or, or ways to improve their business. So I did this with local entrepreneurs, but I also did it with a handful of authors. And one of them was Ramit Sethi. Um, I helped him with the launch of his book, I Will Teach You To Be Rich. And that did really well. I was also helping him with video editing. Um, his book hit number one on Amazon, which back then that wasn't really, uh, you know, that now there's like this whole uh, little industry around helping authors hit number one. But we beat out Twilight when Twilight was wow. the thing, you know, so it was a big deal. And we were like stunned. Um, so on. 
wittingly, I sort of developed a reputation as a book marketer. And so all of a sudden, as a 22 year old, I had uh, authors coming to me asking for advice. And so um, Ramit was friends with Tim and I asked him for if he'd be willing to introduce me at some point. And I did the same thing with Tim. I sent him some suggestions and ways I thought we, uh, he could improve his business and how I could handle those things for him and why I was a good fit. We started working together, um, initially on an hourly basis. I flew out to meet him at some point. We hung out for a weekend and he, uh, asked if I'd like to help him with, uh, editing and eventually launching the four hour body if I wanted to be involved. Um, he hired me on as his first full-time employee and we ended up working together for a few years and really enjoyed that time. I mean, it was a wonderful experience. And so now you're, you're, you've got a kind of couple of roles. Obviously you're, you're an author in your own right. You've had some very successful kind of books and we, we'll talk about those. Um, but then you also have this role of with Scribe Media, you can head a video and then you can, you're kind of advising, you've been advising, I know many, many authors, some uh, you know, some very high, high profile, you might not necessarily want to say who they are, but I know you're often the, the, been the guy behind the scenes uh, to some, some pretty big uh, book launches as well. Um, so I'm thinking that you've, you've, you've got Ramit, you've got Tim, you've got Tucker Max that you I know you work with as well. These are all pretty uh, kind of interesting characters. They have a very strong voice you know, sense of voice in what they do. So, so I'm get, are you the foil uh, for them? <laughs> because, because I'm guessing that they, they're all really strong creatives in terms of marketing. They've got, they've got great marketing creative brains as well. And you're coming in with your ideas. So when it comes to this idea of collaboration, how, you know, how does that work when working with an author, especially an author that actually maybe has a good understanding about marketing? It's really like I have to believe in what they're doing, right? I, I have to feel strongly about what they're doing. And I, I find myself drawn to people who see the world a bit differently. Like they have a different perspective from, I guess, the masses. And um, I, I feel they have an important message. So marketing becomes easy for me because i mean it's it's a natural way of operating that's just who i am it's it's how i'm built um, but it it becomes even more exciting and uh enjoyable to to come up with ideas because i'm thinking of what would work for me if they did this what would get me really excited i've tried to work on books in the past that i was like ah this isn't for me and i've learned my lesson that i'm not very good i'm not a great marketer for people who i don't really care that much about if i don't feel fully aligned with so um it's I don't know. It's it's hard for me to answer that question because I don't want to I, do, I certainly don't want to be dismissive of it and say, hey, this is just how I operate. This is who I am. Um, but at the same time, I know that's a, a decent part of the equation. Am I making sense or am I kind of rambling? No, no. I mean, I, cause I come from the music industry originally. And so my role was always being the manager of you know, platinum selling artists, Grammy award winning artists. And it's a similar kind of function that you have. You're working with very, very creative people, often very, um, you know, they, they actually might not consider themselves as being um, exhibitionists. They might be there on stage in their public persona, but inside they're actually usually quite quiet and very thoughtful people. Um, but you have to kind of find a way in terms of working with them because they have lots of they're great creative ideas and then you you're coming in with your creative ideas and it's like how that it's like that it's a kind of marriage of minds it's not an easy relationship yeah yeah you know i so i i get better understand the question now and my apologies so um yeah i think there's a, there's a few parts to that equation one is um assuming equal status Right. You're both on the same team. You're both. Uh, it, it's non-combative. Um, I think improv can really help uh, with learning this kind of communication style. You're yes anding. You're not saying no, but or no. Uh, it, it's it's very uh, supportive and always building. You're not grinding things to a halt and you're always respectful uh, toward toward them. Um and, and really, I, 
I, this is again, I think a personality type of mine. I feel much more comfortable being behind the scenes and uh, not pulling the strings because that assumes that I'm like a puppet master. That's not it. Um, but I like helping steering the ship and taking somebody who's already going a hundred miles an hour to 200 miles an hour. It's, it's just, it, it's fun. It's exciting. So, um, I've been told by these guys, like I wouldn't come up with this answer on my own. They told me that a big part of why they enjoyed working with me is I'm fun and I'm kind and I'm respectful, but also, you know, I just come with good ideas. And I, I think a lot of people could do the exact same, um, but y you, you kind of have to have a positive energy, one that they they enjoy being around. Otherwise, it's it can be tough. And I think I think it's, it is an undervalued role um, because I often think about it. You know, the 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 kind of sage on the stage and the guide on the side. And those yeah. authors are the kind of sages and, and with the guides and, you know, helping and, and either. Which is a great, a great line, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think there's that, there's that way you're kind of helping provide leverage for someone or an individual that's already pretty, pretty leveraged themselves. You kind of know what they, they're doing and you're, you're kind of a adding to that. You wrote a really yeah. funny uh, post on Medium a while back. It was, um, it was called How to Sell a Million Books, um, which it, it kind of made me laugh because you kind of, you kind of gave the, gave the game away <laughs> the very first sentence uh, when you can. So let me ask you, I know nothing about books. How do you sell a million books, Charlie? Yeah, so it's a great question. Oh, one other thing to your previous question I wanted to add is execution. Like I, I would execute. That's just, I mean, it kind of goes without saying, but then again, it doesn't. Like you have to work and get results. Otherwise, you can't work with these people. So um, how to sell a million books. So the joke that I I often tell to authors who say, how do I sell a million books is I say, you have to buy 995,000 copies of your own book uh, because it's really hard and you have to, it, there are so many variables and factors that you, you have to get right A and B, you have no control over at the same time. So you can optimize a bunch of these things, but even if you do everything perfectly, if the cultural zeitgeist is not perfectly aligned, if you're not right at the crest of the wave before it breaks, you're not gonna sell a million copies. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. So um, a few years ago, I think it was five or six years ago, uh, a popular blogger reached out to me, or, or I reached out to him. I complimented him on an article that I really liked, and he responded and he said, "Hey, um, you know, I'm familiar with your work. I'm considering writing uh, my next book, and I want to go with a traditional publisher this time." And I just, uh, you know, a year before or so, I, I'd helped Tim with the four hour body, and then we'd started work on the four hour chef. And my experience with traditional publishers, not to knock them, but I found it really frustrating working with them because I didn't feel like it was such an exceptional uh, service uh, that. It warranted even then, you know, several years ago, it's self publishing has gotten even better now. Um, but even back then, I was like, I don't think the cost of how much time it takes going with a traditional publisher is worth going with them. And so I kind of wrote back and I, I just encouraged him, hey, consider self publishing, stick with self publishing. I don't think traditional publishing is the right move. And I was kind of a jerk about it because I was an arrogant uh, mid-20s. So he wrote back and I clearly rubbed him the wrong way. And he was like, I'm in this for the long haul, blah, blah, blah. I want to go traditional publishing route. He recently published his book, which sold a million copies in six months, called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a F*** <laughs> by Mark Manson. Uh, and so... I was totally wrong with him, completely. He made the right decision, but perfect timing for the book. Anyone who tells you, anyone who sold a million copies will tell you, yes, they got a lot of things right, but they were also extraordinarily lucky yeah. 
not to diminish their efforts, but they were extraordinarily lucky that they came out with the right book at the exact right time. And that's something we, it's really hard to nail. The number of people of authors who sell a million copies in a year is under 10. There are hundreds of thousands of books that get published each year. You're not going to do it. <laughs> so that's yeah. why I say you have to buy 995,000 copies. And if you're one of those authors who says, how do I sell a million copies, get on Oprah and hit number one New York Times bestseller? My response is always, it's a lot easier to do six months of therapy instead <laughs> <laughs> because you're trying to fill a hole in your soul with all of those things. So yeah. you have a slightly different model at Scribe Media. I know a friend of mine, Aaron, has worked with you before on, on, a, on a book project. So, so we often think of this idea that you, know, you have traditional publishing and then you have this independent or, or self-publishing and you're kind of all, your, all, all on your own. You maybe have a KDP Amazon account or something and, and you kind of, it's all on you. But you have this di slightly different model with Scribe Media. It, describe, how, how does it work? Um, because this has yeah. been something that's been like an, an evolution. It's kind of still going on very much in, in the, the publishing industry. Yeah, so we, we have what's basically um, called hybrid publishing where we combine the best of both worlds and get rid of all the awful stuff. Because both sides, whether you go with a traditional publisher, which you think is gonna be this amazing, great thing, but has serious compromises, or if you go the self-publishing route where you're doing everything yourself, which again, you have more control, you have greater royalties and blah, 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 but it's still really hard and you can screw everything up and totally damage your, your efforts, your brand if you do anything wrong. Um, we, we eliminate the pains and compromises of both. So at Scribe, it is your book, it is your royalties, it's your rights, you get everything. Um, but we remove the pain of having to uh, write a proposal, having to write it all by yourself. So the reason we're called Scribe is because we write books literally with scribes. Jesus didn't write the Bible. Malcolm X didn't write his own autobiography. Buddha never wrote anything down. They had other people who were scribes writing what they said. So we interview the book out of you. We have professional outliners who come up with the outline based on the idea that you have. We'll tell you if the idea is not uh, quite aligned or if you're trying to pack too much in one book, which is a common mistake. And then we spend about 40 to 50 hours on the phone interviewing the content out of you. So not everyone is right for this, right? Like if you want a ghostwriter, if you want somebody to make up your life or your career and you want a book as a branding piece, this isn't right for you. You're going to have to spend over 100K to get someone to do that. But if you really know what you're talking about, if you're an expert in your field, so like a coach or a consultant or a thought leader in your niche, it's a really good fit. So we've done over 800 books over the last four years. Um, the biggest most famous book that we've done was Tiffany Haddish's book, The Last Black Unicorn. She was the first, uh, she's a, she's a uh, stand-up comedian, and she was the first uh, female black comedian to ever host SNL. She blew up this past summer. Um, and so we've done a huge variety of books, and it, you know, to, from, from the self-publishing side, we remove all the negative sides there, right? So you get a professional book, or designer, you know, interior layout designer. Uh, you get somebody who writes your author bio, helps you with the author photo. We get the book on Amazon for you. And then we actually market your book for the first week to set a foundation for your book to sell for many years to come. So we do all the hard, heavy lifting that comes with self-publishing um, and and make sure that it's professionally done so you look and in, in repre are represented at your best. And I guess that, that model works really well if someone is a, say, professional speaker, um, where mm -hmm. th that's how they like to communicate. They, they, they're very kind of verbal, yeah. that's how they can think. Or if someone's maybe a CEO, entrepreneur, you know, senior executive, 
and you know writing they 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 communicate very well uh verbally but it's yeah. you know so there is such a craft in, in in writing so i guess that that model can work extremely well for for those folks that just want they, they've got their they know what they're talking about they're a, they're seen as a thought leader a subject matter expert and it's like getting that stuff out of their head into the onto the page to a, to a level that people not just want to read it but actually really enjoy it and then tell other people about it Absolutely. You know, we've we've had a lot of executives in um, leadership roles at companies do books, but it's it's a no brainer for speakers because they often have done numerous speeches that can fill up a book. Yeah. And they keep giving the same speech. Um, If they're if they're speaking dozens of times a year. I mean, at a minimum, they can add a few grand per speech just by offering their books to attendees. And so it's, it's, I mean, it's really a no brainer for them. And actually, one of the things that you did in terms of reaching out to authors with ideas it happened to me recently. I'm not going to say who, uh, the company, but they were, uh, let's say, a hybrid publisher. And I gave a speech. I was speaking in Singapore, gave this keynote, and within a week, they'd actually this company email me completely out of the blue and said we saw your keynote um and uh here's the book cover for it they'd mocked up the book cover they'd mo- essentially mocked almost like a business plan for the book <laughs> based upon my wow. keynote and i thought okay that i mean it, it, you get on a call with them it, you know it's, it's not necessarily right for me but I, right. I, I just think i think that was great initiative from that that company to go and do that and to be starting to to reach out to those speakers in that way because when you see the speech that you have just done you've probably sweated buckets over and then someone sending you the book cover of it you know with your 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 name on it and an outline you know uh, kind of proposal for it then that's kind of interesting that 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 makes an interesting (laughs) interesting idea i know yeah one of uh you know we're the only ones to do i strongly feel we're the best at what we do uh, but one of the one of the similar companies, uh, maybe the the same one you mentioned. I mean, they they were doing cold outreach with little videos on LinkedIn, and I mean, it was super effective. So I, I love that. That's a great idea. Now, one topic you have written a lot about, which uh, you know, affects us all at different points in our, our, our career, is this idea of burnout. Um, so you you've like you've gone you've been working with some huge names and you were doing you know, moving very very fast and you, the authors you were working with moving very very fast as well. So can you tell us about you know, why did you write that book? What was that book all all about? What was the inception of it? Yeah, so uh, that book is called Play It Away: uh, A Workaholic's Cure for Anxiety. I should have called it an Entrepreneur's Cure for Burnout, but. Uh, it, you know, subtitles, whatever. Um, so Play It Away came about because I really, you know, for years, Tim and I were working really well together. And then there was this event that as my responsibilities grew, he put me in charge of this big event. I think it was 24, 25 at the time. And um, the event was a uh, book marketing book publishing event that attendees paid $10,000 to attend in Napa Valley for four days um, and 130 people were coming with, you know, really big speakers and everything. And I was in charge of coordinating everything. And my experience in event planning was effectively like throwing keggers in college and, uh, you know, I, th- I've thrown some VIP parties with Tim and I'd done a pretty good job, like, but, you know, just by the skin of my teeth, this sort of thing, it just, it, I, so I got really nervous, uh, going into this and I, I re- secretly ordered uh, modafinil, which is a brain pill used by the military to keep, uh, military fighter pilots awake oh my and God. is now prescribed to narcoleptics to keep them from <laughs> spontaneously falling asleep. And so I took this pill four days in a row and I slept six hours over the course of 96 hours, which is a one to 18 ratio. Human beings are designed to have a one to two ratio, basically eight hours for every 16 you're awake. Uh, so I was a little skewed there. Um, 
And uh, it may be a one to 16 ratio. I can't do the math, but uh, yeah, one to 16, I believe. But in any case, um, I was really kind of messed up after that and kept ignoring the symptoms because I was so like, um, in, 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 I was just addicted to being a productivity machine, you know, in San Francisco, that's the culture yeah. out there. Like it was not weird to anybody that I was doing that. In fact, multiple people were like, where do I get those pills? And in fact, like there are CEOs, there are people in Silicon Valley coders for sure that are taking this. It's a, it's a brain steroid, basically. Like you want to complain about baseball players. This is what you know, a lot of people use to enhance their performance. And why wouldn't you, you know, you're able to execute on levels that are previously unimaginable. Uh, but the problem was I just got really sort of, I, my identity shifted from being like, I'm doing what I love and I, I'm helping these people doing great work to being productive, being successful, being very serious and it completely wiped me out. And uh, I, then I went through some emotional traumas that I didn't understand were emotional traumas. Uh, like, you know, a family member died, a, a close friend attempted suicide uh, in the same weekend. Um, and, it, you know, the deadline for the book that we were working on got pushed back six months. And I was like, I'm never going to make it. So I quit my job with Tim. And that was an emotionally traumatic thing, not because he made it, but because if you leave anything, if you rip a part of your identity out and are worried that you've burned bridges and stuff, like it's just, it, it is a, an emotional trauma, which I just didn't understand at the time. So I just, you know, I, I kept repeating this cycle of working myself from four in the morning, sleeping for a few hours, getting up doing it all over again, drinking five cups of coffee a day. Uh, you know, it was just this cycle of overwork during the week and numbing out with alcohol on the weekend and drugs. Um, and a lot of people are in this cycle and it took me a few years to really undo it. And I tried everything, everything that, you know, a medical professional would tell you this is going to alleviate anxiety and nothing worked. And I remember telling my girlfriend at the time, she started, she started kind of grilling me one night. She's like, what happened to you? I, you're not the guy that I met. And I remember telling her, I, it, like, I feel dead inside all the time and I don't know how to fix it. And I remember that conversation because she started crying and I felt jealous that she could cry because I just couldn't, like I just felt so numb. So to, to bring us to the lightness is I discovered a book just kind of serendipitously called Play by Stuart Brown, Dr. Stuart Brown. And the book is about really the evolutionary benefits of play. Why, why do we play yeah. when it seems like this frivolous, wasteful activity? Why do humans play so much? Uh, and the answer is it is essential to our survival. It is essential to our mental well-being. A playful person equals a person who doesn't have mental health issues. Uh, the opposite of of depression, uh, I'm sorry, the opposite of uh, play is not work. It's depression. So that that's what it was one of the big things is I, I just realized if I start – Maybe I realized I, I just deprived myself of play for years and being playful. And even though that's who I am at my core and who you are and who everyone is. Because it's, it's kind of beaten out of us, you know, at school and at college, you're told, OK, it's, it's, it's adult time now, you know. And yeah, uh, but it, I, I find it fascinating because you mentioned this idea of play. I interviewed someone while like Bernie DeCoven, who's like the kind of grandfather yeah. of play studies. Very and playful, and, yeah. and this and he just says, you know, it's kind of beaten out of us now. Uh, this this idea of, uh, this idea of play, but actually there's that difference between also play and playfulness. And he said, if you look at the, some of the most creative people in the world, they're actually playful. very playful. They're actually yes. they're very playful <laughs> with ideas, whether they're scientists or artists or whatever. Yes, exactly. I mean, the guy who quite literally invented the internet. 
I forget his name. There's a book about him. The book is called A Mind at Play. Um, the most recent book I did was an art project uh, with 75 of the world's biggest influencers, creators, inventors, people who shaped our culture. And the book is called Play for a Living. And it's just quotes about how they felt about how to approach work in their career. So whether it's people like Thomas Edison, Albert Einstein, Plato, J.K. Rowling, you know, Steve Jobs, all of these people viewed life and work in the same lens, which was this is a game that I get to mold and create and collaborate with others on. And we get to produce the fruits of our play and share it with the world and the people who I mean, it, like there's really clear research on this now that shows like the highest motivators for great performance in order are play, then purpose and then uh, like payment. So it, like, I love Simon's speech, I think it's amazing, but I think it's also wrong because purpose comes second. You have to start with intrinsic motivation. What is your internal paycheck? What is the fun that you get that you would do this even if you weren't getting paid, even if there wasn't a mission, you're doing it just because it's you. Yeah. So I think you start with play and not start with why. I love that. I love that. I mean, this is uh, for anyone that's what, uh, you know, many of the people that I know that's with the speakers or CEOs, they're pretty A-type person personalities. They're pretty driven already. They're achievers. They're achievers. Yeah. They're achievers. And so, um, and you kind of lose that sense of, sense of play. And I, I love watching, um, I love what I think it was Austin Cleon was talk, talked about it was this idea where you if you watch a three-year-old or four-year-old maybe it was Hugh McLeod actually uh, and you just watch them they get completely immersed in what in like painting and drawing and they're in what psychologists call a flow state you know they're and they, they don't even think and they get they lose all track of time uh, as well and and it's that same sensation that we have when we're doing the work where that's the writing you know uh, or where it's marketing creating up with marketing campaigns we lose all kind of track of time because we're playing. We're, we're not working. We're playing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, this is the reason why I, you know, I never personally, even though I've written a few books and worked with a lot of authors, I never personally identified with being um, an author. Those were just things I had to get out of my head. I had to, otherwise it would go crazy. Um, and I felt like they, the messages weren't in existence anywhere else. So I had to get them out. But I really love video because it puts me into flow. It is my play. There's no other form of work I've found that I enjoy more than that. So um, I think we all need to have that, whether it's our work or our hobby. If you don't have that, it really makes life robotic and mechanical and serious and dry and just kind of blah. It makes it very gray. Yeah. But if you have play in your regular routine, you're a much more vibrant person. And I think especially if you can also add that play element that is physical as well. We sit, sit yeah. down so much of the time as well. You know, if there's things that you can find that which is, is going to be going to help and, and is going to be active as well, that's great. So um, as we start to finish up here, a couple of kind of quick fire questions for you. I would love to know, are there any tools that you find really useful? And actually, I'm, I'm going to ask this specifically as you as a videographer, because you mm. are, you know, you're pushing in terms of how video could, is, a, is a major, major new tool for us. But are, are there any online tools, mobile tools, apps that you find very useful for yourself as a videographer and as someone that has to market books? The most I would say is YouTube. <laughs> like it, it, you can go through literally you can get a film school education in less than a day watching people like uh, Parker Wallback, who does a, a full-time filmmaker. Um, every scene of paint, uh, every scene of painting, I think, or every frame of painting. Um, there's so much good stuff. And all you really have to worry about, James, is, um, is story. That's all that matters. Which is which link, links to the author part as well. So it's the same. It's a storytelling. Yes. You're just using a different medium to tell the story. Exactly. Beginning, middle, end. I mean, it just it would just watch watch things that you love, and you know maybe jot down notes of why you love it. Like um, every 
all the tools we have now are amazing. A, a new iPhone is indistinguishable from a $50,000 red camera. Indistinguishable. Like I'm not saying like almost there. It's you can't tell. So the tools are relevant, right? Like anybody can publish a book in a Word document, right? It's the question is, do you have something worth saying? Yeah. Do you have something worth reading and talking about? And it's the same thing with video. Are you telling a story that's worth watching and worth sharing? And if you if you learn those basic principles, you can make whatever you want. I mean, it's 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 just art it's it's storytelling so um i i know the temptation is to to come up with a juicy slick polished answer but really it's like there's so much great stuff out there it's so easy to attain and learn from and what about a book if there's one book if someone's watching this just now they're kind of intrigued by this idea of maybe going down the self-publishing or the independently published route but they're maybe a little worried about the craft of writing or they're worried about the um, the marketing side of it or the, in the distribution side. Is there a book that you would recommend for them to check out? Yeah, I would honestly recommend ours, uh, The Scribe uh, Book Method, I believe is what it's called. We had to rename it because we just rebranded the company. I, I, don't, I know you can get it for free at the, at the site, um, but... Yeah, I mean, it, that lays out our exact process, which I believe is the easiest, simplest process you can use. I mean, Brene Brown, right? It, like, sh she's a wonderful author, wonderful speaker. She uses a process that's very similar to ours where, you know, she communicates her book to a group of people to, to gauge their feedback rather than holding up in a cave in isolation. Like, you make it more of a simple rather than the romanticized version of you know reenacting the shining or or holding up in a cabin and doing that so that's it that's the book i'd recommend i read the previous version when it was called some something else of that book it's a great book in terms of talking through that that methodology and i remember interviewing amanda palmer the, the the songwriter and musician at the time and uh, we were actually kind of talking about this idea she was talking about like second screen writing is what she calls it like she'll be writing and then she's kind of reaching out to a community on social media saying like what's a better word for this thing here and like she's she's constantly having a conversation with her readers her end audience about this and that makes them super intrigued about the book because they feel part of of that the journey of that or that journey of creation um what about an album is there an album that you would would recommend people people check out that you really love oh music oh yeah. great question i love this let me uh I've been really enjoying Leon Bridges oh, recently. Yeah. Uh, check out Leon Bridges. Uh, look at his most popular stuff on on YouTube. Um, his music's great. And then Tycho, T Y C H O, uh, is great to write to and do work to. It's just really relaxing and. It's actually great dinner party music if you have a dinner party. Great. We'll put those links here as well. And a final question for you, Charlie. I want you to imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and you have to start from scratch. So you've got all the skills, all the knowledge you've acquired over the years, but no one knows who you are. Uh, you know no one. You have to restart. What would you do? How would you restart things? I know no one. Is that what you said? You, you know no one. No one knows you. You know no one. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I'm basically on Mars. Uh, but I'm surrounded by Martian. Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick you in. I'll stick you in a good city. I'll let you choose the city you want, whether it's Austin or San Francisco or some, somewhere that you would like. But you know no one. No one knows you. How are you going to restart things? Oh, my gosh. So in this completely likely scenario, um, <laughs> let's see. Honestly, I think I would probably... Where I would start, I would I would have to start just meeting people around. Because here's why: like the money and stuff, like you can you can always make that. You can figure out ways of doing. There's a million ways to make money. But if you don't have friends around you, you're screwed. Like you will be screwed eventually if if you are operating in isolation. So 
the the question assumes I'm not knowing anybody. So my first order of business is to befriend somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and so so if you know shit hits the fan, I've got a couch to sleep on and all this <laughs> like we are social animals first. Money comes second. So I would I, that would be my answer and I'd figure out the money second. Wonderful. Charlie, thank you so much for coming on. It's, it's, it's great finally getting a chance to speak in person instead of email. Uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to catch up maybe in Austin. In, in a, in a, I know you're in one of the best music cities in the world as well uh, over there. So thanks so, much for, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, James. And I'm curious, what would be your album that you would recommend? Oh, see, it's difficult. I'm a jazz drummer originally. So I'd probably have to go, if it was an, if it was an album... Let's have a think. Oh, that's, a, that's a hard one because you ask a musician what album they, they would choose. It's like asking a parent which of their children would they, <laughs> they would keep. It's, um, I would say if, if I was left on, on a desert island with one album, it would probably be my namesake, James Taylor, the other James Taylor because I'm friends with some of yeah. his band members. And, oh, uh, no kidding. And, that, that, and I've seen James live in, uh, in, in the Bay Area recently as well. And uh, yeah, the music always a lot of memory. So probably the other James Taylor. Uh, nothing earth shattering there. You, you know how like all the research shows you're more likely to like somebody if their name is the same or really? similar to yours? I didn't know yes. that. <laughs> you, you have uh, a bias toward those people. I wonder if you are biased toward James Taylor for that reason. Very possibly. Find He's you. great. We're gonna, I'm, we're, I'm not taking anything away from him. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to find that, that Charlie Hone, that music artist out there, that Charlie Hone singer songwriter. My original name it was actually Led Zeppelin, <laughs> but I changed. <laughs> So. <laughs> by deed poll anyway Charlie thanks so much for coming on it's just a, a, a pleasure I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do with with, uh, with Scribe uh, really cool company with, uh, with all, all the people you've got there and thanks so much for sharing your knowledge today my pleasure thank you again James if you're interested in living a more creative life then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to James Taylor dot me that's james taylor dot me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity